We will start out today with the 103rd Psalm. This is a Psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you hosts, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. You know, this psalm here, it uh, speaks of the Lord casting our sins as far as they are from the east from the west. And that was written at a time when, of course, they didn't have compasses. They didn't know that there was a magnetic north and a magnetic south. If you get in an airplane and you fly to the north, the uh, compass will be reading north, and as soon as you go over that magnetic north and start heading south, the compass switches around. But when you're flying in an airplane, either east or west, the compass will never change the direction that you're flying in. It will always stay the same. In other words, your sins are cast infinitely far away from you when you call on the name of the Lord Jesus. That's the glory of what the Lord has done for us. And uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the sermon today, what he did, but we're gonna see some beautiful pictures in the sermon today from Isaac's blessing of Jacob. And I have to tell you that when I was preparing this sermon, I was just, I was standing in awe at what the Lord has revealed or concealed in his word, which he reveals to us. It's just absolutely astonishing. Things that I had never considered, which came out really, really wonderful stuff. So let's open in prayer here. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word and we thank you for Jesus who it gives us the ability to stand in your presence free from the stain of sin. We're completely cleansed by what he did, and we just want to give you praise and honor and glory for it. What a wonderful creator you are. You've given us a great week behind, and we anticipate a good week in uh, the days to come, and we just thank you that you're with us and guiding us no matter what. Our afflictions are, are just temporary and that you will lead us to streets of glory, and we just look forward to that. Uh, I pray for each person that couldn't make it here today. I know there's some that are serving the nation and uh, others that couldn't make it for whatever reason. I want to keep them in prayer and pray for each person here who is here today that uh, they will hear something that may bless them or they'll see some new insight into your word which they've not considered before at the majesty of what you have tucked away there for us. And Lord, just be with us during this sermon and help us to uh, be pleasing to you not only now, but throughout the week ahead as we ponder the things that you've given us. What a great and wonderful creator you are. All glory, all majesty, all honor to you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen. amen. Well, I have just a couple announcements. I'm not gonna get into any detail on announcements other than to say that if you uh, wanna be baptized, we have water and uh, we can do that any day of the week. And um, today is our 61st sermon from Genesis. And I think the last thing that I want to announce today is that uh, the Reynolds Street property, I don't want anybody here to lose heart in this, but I canceled the contract um, on buying the property. And the reason why is because um, the parking cannot be resolved on the property uh, as it is. However, after doing that, I called the uh, rabbi that used to be in the synagogue, which was in that building, and um, he told me what they did in order to justify the number of people they had in the building was they went to the funeral home down the road and the funeral home 
signed a letter saying that they could park in their parking lot. And by doing that, they could meet the requirements of Sarasota County. The county attorney approved that and gave them a waiver. And so they expanded and uh, uh, that's where they met for, I believe it was seven years. And um, I happened to be at Toll Brothers uh, Saturday because of a funeral of a girl that we went to school with. And um, I happened to uh, meet one of the Toll Brothers who uh, I explained the situation and he said he'd check with his brother. If they agree to this in the week ahead, then um, uh, I will have a piece of paper I can present to the county. And that actually means that we could work this out after all. So uh, that's where we're at with that. If it doesn't come out, then the Lord didn't want us there anyway. And so we'll find something else. But in the meantime, we have astonishingly beautiful weather today. And um, I, I just have to thank the Lord for it because last night we had the strongest wind that I remember in eons off of the bay. It was very, very windy out there. It was very noisy from the waves hitting the shore. This morning was the same. It was very windy. And I thought it's just not gonna work out at the beach today, but fortunately it's coming just from the direction where all of the RVs and all of the trees over there, it, it's as quiet as it can be here. So I wanna thank the Lord for that. And um, uh, if anybody has anything on their heart they need prayed about in the week ahead, please just give me a call and, uh, or an email and uh, we'll, we'll work together with that. And uh, I think that's all of the announcements I have as far as uh, it is. That's all I have. So let me go ahead and do real quickly a New Testament reading. We are going to have a lot of New Testament in the sermon today. In fact, I'll say this right now, is that I'm going to go back and forth so much in the uh, sermon, quoting other scripture. I don't want you to get dizzy by it, but what God has shown in this blessing of Jacob is so intricate, I could only actually include a, a small portion of it, but it's, it is so beautiful that I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. So I am going to quote a lot of uh, scripture. But we'll do a New Testament reading anyway. Romans 12, we'll go 9 uh, through 21 in that. Romans uh, 12, 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. No comment necessary, very straightforward. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. In other words, giving preference to one another means that esteem others higher than yourself. And, uh, you know, when things conflict between the two of you, give preference to the other person and uh, be uh, humble and congenial in your attitude towards others and all of your dealings. Um, in verse 11, not lagging in diligence, fervor, fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Okay, those three, rejoicing in hope is the fact that we know that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and no matter what, we should be rejoicing in that. And that leads to the second thing that he says, patient in tribulation. Um, I am not a person that will preach on prosperity. I'm not a person that will preach on uh, uh, feeling good all the time. Paul never teaches that. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever teach that. It teaches that we suffer in this world. Bad things happen to us. We make bad choices. People around us make bad choices. But Paul says to be patient in tribulation. Uh, that means when the troubles come that we should have patience and endure through that trouble. All right, and then continuing steadfastly in prayer. I've said it many times that there are two ways that I can think of immediately where we uh, commune with God. One is by reading his word, and the second is through praying to him. And uh, as it says, I quote it week after week, in him we live and move and have our being. We are right in his presence. So when you are praying continuously, you can do that simply by talking to him. He is your Lord and he has uh, accepted you because of Jesus Christ, and so you just speak. He is right there listening. His Holy Spirit is evaluating each one of us. And so I don't care. I said this to somebody just a day ago. They were at my house asking for advice for about an hour. And uh, I said, you know what? I just speak to the Lord all the time. While I'm taking out the garbage at the mall and people see me, I could not care. If they think I'm nuts, well, that's their problem. I love the Lord and he's there with me. And have that attitude when you're driving. You know, oh, I got a green light. Thank you, Lord. Whatever, just speak to him. And the more you do, the more you are being filled with him. Being filled with the spirit in the Bible is passive. It is not active. The, when you call on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have all of the spirit that you will ever get, ever in your life, the moment that you call on him. The Bible teaches that the spirit can get more of you. And he does that as you yield to him. 
as you speak to him, as you read his word, the Holy Spirit will get more of you. That is the filling of the Holy Spirit that the Bible speaks of. It's not what you see in churches around the world where people are calling on the Holy Spirit to come. It doesn't work that way. He is already there. You are yielding to him. So please, please bear that in mind. Um, verse 13, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospita hospitality. I was at a uh, church meeting last night, just to, for a short time before uh, I went out with my wife somewhere to do something. And um, while we were there, they had some homeless people that they accept into their church. And the homeless people are there and the people stay with them and sleep with them, take care of them. And then those people move to another church and they have a, a group of churches that are taking care of these homeless. And uh, they're doing that out of the love of God and to lead people to Christ. And maybe they already know Christ, but there they are. They're distributing to the needs of the saints and they're given to hospitality. I thought, what a great thing they're doing. Uh, verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. I got to tell you what, as Paul is writing these words in Romans 12, it is very similar to what Jesus says in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, one precept, precept after another is being followed by Paul in his thinking. Now, Jesus was speaking the Beatitudes under the law, and we can't apply the law to us. But when Paul repeats it, it is a precept that we are to apply to ourselves in the New Testament church. And so when he says that, bless and do not curse, Bless those who persecute you, and bless and do not curse, that we should do that. And that is one of the hardest things to do, I gotta tell you what. For me, it is very, very hard to, uh, to uh, bless those who persecute me. And we see it more and more in the government, we see it uh, uh, just in life in general, atheists and uh, people, pagans out in the world that are just railing against Christianity. That doesn't mean we have to like what they're doing, it doesn't mean we have to agree with what they're doing, and it also does not mean that we have to accept what they are doing in the sense that we just roll over and say, okay, it, you get it your way. Not at all. But in the process of working against them, we should be blessing them, okay? That's, that's the idea that I receive from that. Verse 15, rejoice, those, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. The uh, book of Ecclesiastes says that uh, uh, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. And the reason why is because when we go to the house of mourning, like I did yesterday in that funeral, our life is put in perspective. If we are in the house of feasting all the time, we're never thinking about our end. We're never thinking about the things that are most important. We're just going through life and enjoying life. But when you go to the house of mourning, you see that there is an end to life. And the person that I uh, uh, went to the funeral for yesterday, I think she was 48, maybe 49 years old. And her life ended what we would consider abruptly and uh, much earlier than we think it probably should have. But I can tell you that she knew the Lord and the entire service was dedicated to the Lord. And anybody that was not a Christian that went there uh, to the house of mourning came, I am certain of this, they came away with at least an, a comprehension and understanding of what she believed, why she believed it, and what they needed to do in order to participate in that as well. Doesn't mean they accepted Christ, I have no idea, but uh, there was no doubt when you walked out of there that this was a Christian woman who wanted everybody in that room to know who Christ was and what he meant to her. Okay, um, verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Man, I love that one and I gotta tell you what, that is Facebook in one sentence right there. People all over just so high on themselves and so high on what they believe. And uh, uh, they just, they have no humility. They're out there just showing the world how arrogant they are. And uh, you know, it, it says to do just the opposite. Be of the same mind toward one another. He's speaking to the saints. In other words, be like the other saints. Do not set your mind on high things. And you know, it's fine. If the Lord blesses you and you're a multimillionaire or you've got a great big company or whatever, that's wonderful, but don't set your mind on those things because they are temporary at best. How many people do we know that in the past couple years have lost everything? Everything, just through you know chance and circumstance and a bad economy. And it could happen to any one of us at any time. So we need to uh, not be wise in our own opinion, okay? God gave those people those things and God decided to take those things away. And being wise in our own opinion just leads to 
uh, more suffering than we should when the bad times come. All right, verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Once again, real hard for me. You know, somebody uh, strikes me on one cheek, I want to strike them on both. But it says don't do that. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And uh, I, it makes me think of a guy that lives right down the road. He's about 88 years old, and I take care of his property. And uh, he, he, you know, he uh, attends a Lutheran church, and I don't know how strong he believes, believes in Jesus. I, I believe he's a Christian, uh, you know, a saved Christian, but he just thinks good of everybody. He sees the good in every single person, and I don't care how bad they are. He will find something good in that person, and he will build them up with that as he's speaking to them. And uh, if he can do that, each one of us can too. So it's something we need to cultivate, and he's cultivated it through a long life of understanding. He was in World War II. You know, he served in Okinawa. Uh, just uh, he saw a lot of battle and a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure bad things when he was there. And he just ex decided to accept the uh, the good way in life. Anyway, um, verse 18: If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Once again, I, I will give an example of a person that I know does this very, very well, and she is sitting right here today. She's had neighbors that were just very belligerent to her, and all she does is turn around and say, Jesus bless you. And now they are bringing her cookies and bringing her baskets of fruit, and uh, it, it is an astonishing thing for me to know that she does this. And there's only two ladies here, and I can tell you it's not my mother. Actually, there's three. My wife is sitting here too. It's not my wife or my, other, my mother. So there's one other person here that does that. And uh, I, I stand in amazement at how controlled she can be in difficult situations. Because with me, if somebody came out and did the things they did to her, to me, there would probably be a fight. And I just need to learn to calm myself down a little bit. But uh, my hat is off to this particular individual for being so uh, condescending towards people that are rude to her. Anyway, um, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord will repay all wrongs. He will take care of everything and all wrongs will be made right. I think I'm going to say that in the sermon today. It is a wonderful thing to know that the Lord will take care of the things that society doesn't take care of, that our laws don't take care of. He's there, he's watching, and he will handle every wrong that has happened all the way through human history. And then he says in verse 20, therefore, therefore, when you see therefore, it says, uh, our, the idea is to go back and see what it's there for. Everything we just talked about. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Heaping coals of fire on somebody's head is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of blow this a little bit, but it's basically having them understand in their conscience that these people have been so good to me that my conscience is actually burning because of their goodness to me. And that's kind of what uh, Kelly here has done to her neighbors. She's kind to them. She's uh, friendly towards them, even though they're mean to her. They go home and they have heaping, they've heaped up coals on their head and their head is burning from the fact that they have maligned a person which they should not have maligned. And by doing that, they get this conscience and hopefully will come to a state of repentance. Anyway, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Really wonderful words from Paul. And uh, as I said, uh, all scripture is uh, God breathed. And so actually these are the words of the Lord and Paul is uh, breathing them. The Holy Spirit is breathing them out through Paul to us. And they very closely reflect the uh, precepts of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter five. Great words, wonderful Lord, words from the Lord. And uh, let me pick something up that blew down, which reminds me, uh, I'd like to announce this real quickly, that if anybody here would like to participate in this year's Bible Reading Marathon, it's down in Venice. I did it last year. You can sign up for 30 minutes for an hour, for an hour and a half, and you just stand out there and you read the Bible. And they read the entire Bible over a three-day period, uh, nonstop, day and night. You can pick any time of the day or night to do this. And I can assure you that if you sign up for an hour, when you leave, you will say, man, I wish I signed up for, for two. It goes that quickly and it is that inspiring to do this Bible reading marathon. So please, please, if this is something that you think that you would enjoy, please do it, okay? Um, one more thing here is we will um, read one more Psalm and then we'll go ahead and get into the sermon. Uh, we'll read the 108th Psalm. Let me see here, 108th Psalm. Okay, this is a song 
a psalm of David. O oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Even with my glory, awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples, and I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your mercy is great above the heavens, and your truth reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above all the earth, that your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and measure out the valley of Sukkot. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim, also the helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom, I will cast my shoe. Over Philistia, I will triumph. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, O God, who cast us off? And you, O God, who did not go out with our armies? Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Though God, through God, we will do valiantly, for it is he who shall tread down our enemies. Wonderful words from the Lord. All right, now, before we get into our sermon, as every week, I'd uh, like to go ahead and give you this day in history, and today is uh, February 10th. In the year 1846, on this day in history, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is the Mormons, began their exodus from the west, uh, I'm t sorry, to the west from Illinois. And uh, this is particularly important to me because, uh, as I say week after week, I would hope that nobody here ever trusts me as a pastor without checking what the Bible says that I preach on. And the reason why is because Joseph Smith was a, uh, he was, uh, I, I don't want to speak too badly about any individual, but he was a heretic. What he taught was heresy. And he was also a deviant in many ways, and I won't get into any of those details right now. But what he taught in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was not Christianity as we know it. It's polytheistic. In other words, there are more than one God in uh, Mormonism. They believe that uh, God was a man once, he became God, he, you know, he created the universe, and then from there each one of them will eventually become a God and they'll create their own little world and they'll run that. And the uh, atonement of Jesus Christ is not all sufficient in the Mormon church. They don't believe in the all sufficiency. There are certain things they have to do in order to uh, uh, be saved and to get up into becoming a, a God themselves. So it is a polytheistic religion. It is a heresy. It also adds to the Bible. It adds in the Book of Mormon, and they also hold to something called the Pearl of Great Price. And the reason why this is important is because when you follow a charismatic leader, they did that with, uh, if you remember, the uh, David Koresh. I don't remember the name, the Branch Davidians. Well, he claimed that he was the Lamb of God from the Book of Revelation. And you saw how that ended. All of those people ended up dying. The few that got out of there realized that they were wrong. But uh, Seventh-day Adventism, you have um, Ellen G. White. She uh, wrote uh, entire volumes of prophecies and visions that she had, and they do not align with the Bible. And they hold to these on the level with Scripture. Now, they'll deny this nowadays, but if you go to the Seventh-day Adventist site, and they, will, they will show you that. And these are important things to understand. Either this is the Word of God or it is not the Word of God. Either the Book of Mormon is the Word of God or it's not. And the two are incompatible. And we need to remember these type of things as we are uh, evaluating the church that we are in. Do they hold this as the literal inspired word of God, breathed out as it claims in itself? Are there 66 books? Are there 72 books? I, how do you know? And these are things that are very important. So I can give you the instruction on these things and I can preach sermons on these things, but I want you all to check them out and to always hold fast to these things because eternity really is forever. And uh, I just, it breaks my heart. You know, these people are over there, even to this day, I've been to Salt Lake City and they're fervent in what they believe and what they believe is not right. So please, please always evaluate against the words of the Lord that he has given us in the Holy Bible. Anyway, 1863 in New York City, two of the world's most famous midgets, or I, I don't think they like that term anymore. I think they say small people or little people. Anyway, General Tom Thumb and Lavinia Warren were married. And so uh, kind of an interesting thing. And I remember uh, growing up, we had the, uh, the uh, Ringling Brothers Circus here in Sarasota, and we had all of the small people. They had 
they drove their own cars and they had special things that would allow them to drive, you know, the pedals and everything. And uh, I believe there's still a few of them that live here. But when I was very young, we used to see all the circus people here all the time. Now, the Walindas, most of you know, have been here in Sarasota recently and they are living in Sarasota, but they've been performing in Sarasota. They performed right inside a church a couple weeks ago. They did a high wire act in the church and uh, then they uh, went out over Sarasota somewhere. I saw all kinds of Facebook photos of that. And so really wonderful stuff. But uh, that was part of that back in 1863 is the kind of big circus movement that was going on. And uh, also in 1863, a very good thing happened. The fire extinguisher was uh, patented by Allenson Crane. And, uh, you know, we get a little overburdensome with our regulations in this nation. But when something like what happened in Brazil uh, a week and a half ago happens, we realize that those regulations do serve a good purpose. Uh, how many, 200 and some people died in, a, uh, I think it was a nightclub, and they didn't have proper uh, fire suppression. They didn't have all these things. Well. You know, this guy did his part for the world that we live in by making these portable uh, fire extinguishers. And uh, if you don't have one in your home, please get one. And it reminds me, I think mine is probably out of date. So um, next we have in 1933, a guy named Primo Canara knocked out Ernie Schaff in round 13 in Madison Square Garden in New York City. Now, I know there's not a lot of people here today, but does anybody here know what happened to uh, Schaff during the, uh, the fight? He died. He was knocked out and he died. And so as I bring up, anytime I bring up a war issue or one, something like this is that that man put on his boxing shoes and he put on his boxing gloves and uh, uh, he was probably very confident in himself. Even if I don't win, I'm a strong young man. And uh, he, uh, he had his choice for Jesus Christ before he went into that ring. And either he left that ring going off to glory or he left that ring going off to uh, the opposite and uh, we all are given a choice now is the time of God's favor today is the day of salvation the Bible says uh, Ernie Schaff had his choice he made it and whatever it was it is that way for eternity so uh, you know we we don't know if we're gonna get out on uh, midnight pass today and get run over or for all we know a branch could fall on our heads and kill us we don't know our next breath so please, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your substitute, taking your sin upon himself, do that today. And I'll talk about that more at the end of the sermon today. Uh, 1962, the Soviet Union exchanged uh, American U-2 pilot Francis Gary Powers for the Soviet spy Rudolf Ivanovich Abel being held by the U.S. So we made a spy exchange and the U-2 is... Um, uh, Interesting airplane. I've seen them when I was in Korea. I saw one being pulled out, but um, they're uh, designed to fly very, very high in uh, spy reconnaissance, and they flew so high that they did not believe that the Russians could shoot one down. Well, the Russians proved us wrong on that, and uh, Gary Powers, being a CIA agent, was uh, he carried one of those little cyanide capsules, and he was given the choice to uh, take that rather than being captured, and he did not exercise that choice. Now, right or wrong, he... Uh, uh, did serve a purpose in our uh, spy uh, theater by what happened and uh, uh, the trade was made and so we got powers back and they got uh, this guy Ivanovich, Rudolf Ivanovich Abel. But uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of the nature of the world that we live in. And then finally in 1998, and this one just really torques me off. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to say this and uh, <laughs> a man became the first to be convicted of committing a hate crime in cyberspace. The college dropout had emailed threats to Asian students. You know, hate crimes, all that does is it elevates one group of people above another in importance, and it judges intent. You know, a crime is a crime. If I murder somebody, I need to be judged for that murder. It shouldn't matter if I shoot, you know, my wife's Japanese, or if I shoot a black person or a, a Latino. It, it, we are human beings created in God's image, and it is not appropriate to elevate one group of people or intent against one group of people above another. It's just something that really bothers me. So welcome. Um, anyway, so those, that's uh, this day in history and uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and now we're going to go ahead and get into the sermon, which is Genesis 27 verses 21 through 29. And this is called the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth. And I as I was saying before some of you got here, the, the parallels that are in this blessing of Isaac upon his son Jacob are so beautiful. 
And as I was preparing this sermon, it just, I, I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. And so because of that, I need to quote a lot of scripture back and forth. And I don't want to confuse anybody, but if you grasp what is happening in the Bible, it is, it is so glorious. But in order to make sure that you have the continuity and the context of this blessing, I'm not just going to read those nine verses this week. I'm going to read what we did last week as well, Genesis 27, which would have been uh, verse 1 through 20, and then down through 29. And that way you'll have the context for what we're going to talk about. It really is beautiful. All right, uh, Genesis 27, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son... And he answered him, and here I am. Then he said, Behold now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah's mother, Look, he saw my brother as a hairy man, and I am a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go. Get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were on with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit, and eat of my game that... Your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. This is where we start today. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near me that I may feel you, my son, whether you really are Esau or my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. He said, bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. Here we have this story of deceit and intrigue which God has given us to see pictures of his son who came in the form of a man. The symbolism we'll see in today's sermon is astonishingly beautiful and wonderfully woven into the unfolding plan of God. Simple and obscure words and even names which seem to have no relevance except to tie the sentences together turn out to make astonishing parallels in the life of Jesus and his interactions with those around him. Not a word is given by God that doesn't have an important purpose and so we need to handle his word carefully and prayerfully. We have a text verse for today coming from Ephesians chapter 1. It's verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The blessings of God have come upon a specific line of people even from the very beginning of man's history on earth. All of these blessings have led to the Messiah who is Jesus, the Christ of God. God has given us a choice now of participating in them or being eternally separated from them. 
Either way, whether we receive them or not, we will bow to the one from whom they flow. Every tongue will confess his glory and his lordship. And so may God speak to us through his word today and may his glorious name ever be praised. Our first thought out of three thoughts today is Jacob's voice, Esau's hands. Now our story continues today in the tent of Isaac as he prepares to pronounce his blessing. May our eyes be open to the beautiful pictures which this story continues to display. We come to verse 21. Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you my son, whether you really, you are really my son Esau or not. What we have to keep in mind is something that I brought up in a sermon in Genesis chapter 25, where Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. At that time, I made the connection between Esau and Adam and Jacob and Jesus. It was very clear, and if you missed those sermons, it would be good for you to go back and watch them. I mentioned this again last week because it was tied in to that particular sermon, and it showed that Isaac's blindness and yet his ability to hear as well as to taste food all worked to tie the story into the picture of Jesus. The blindness allowed for Jacob to receive the blessing, which otherwise would not have happened. The healthy taste buds made Isaac and Esau go out, or I'm sorry, it made Isaac send Esau out for wild game instead of getting meat from the flock. He liked wild game, the taste of it. If his taste buds weren't good, then he would have just said, go get me some food and I'm gonna bless you, all right? So we see that God is working in the physical nature of Isaac to show us what he's going to do. The good hearing brought about Isaac's distrust of the situation when he heard Jacob's voice. And so he physically is asking to feel his son to make sure that he is suitable for the blessing. This is a picture of Jesus Christ coming as a man to replace Adam, just as Jacob is here replacing Esau. The test of feeling Jacob pictures the truth of Jesus Christ's human nature. All of this was planned by God to show the story of his son to us. As I say, time and time again, we need to ask questions when we read the Bible. Why is this story recorded? How does this story point to Jesus Christ? And what does God intend for us to see about that? These are real people and they're real stories of their lives and yet they only account for a very minuscule portion of what they did in those lives. At this point, Jacob and Esau are 77 years old, and yet we have maybe 10 minutes of words about their life. God has selected just these little things out of their lives to show us what he is trying to do. Isaac wants to ensure here that it is Esau that he is speaking to, and he's probably wondered how he obtained the food so quickly. Here's what he's probably thinking. You know, I had breakfast at eight o'clock in the morning and I'm gonna be hungry about 12.30. Esau will have to find the animal. He's gonna to have to shoot it. He's gonna to have to carry it home. He's gonna to have to cut it up and he's gonna to have to cook it. Instead though, his lunch is ready, we'll say at 10.45. He says, huh, I'm not even hungry yet. How did this food get so fast? And so he's curious. Even though he didn't know that it wasn't Esau, he wants to feel him now to make sure, and the way he does it is by checking his hair. Now, what is the connection to Jesus here? The answer is found in the book of Hebrews, chapter two. The first sentence and the last will show us what's going on. It's a little long, but here we go. Inasmuch then as the children, meaning us, human beings have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, meaning Jesus Christ, likewise shared in the same, that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We're subject to bondage because of our fear of death. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Just as Jacob is being made like his brother Esau, Jesus Christ is being made like Adam, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God. And we saw that last week and we'll see it again as we go on, that Jacob is wearing the priestly garments of the family. And I'll explain that if you weren't here so you can see that. But he's picturing the high priest, Jesus, all right, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation is a big word. It simply means uh, to make happy again or to restore fellowship. The word propitiation in 
uh, the uh, Old Testament Greek translation of the Bible is actually the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, the propitiation. It's called the Hilasterion. That's where God is restored to man through the blood that is placed on that mercy seat. Verse 18, for in him, for in that he himself has suffered, meaning Jesus being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. All of this is being prefigured by this blessing upon Jacob instead of Esau. Isaac is checking to determine if this really is Esau. Esau pictures Adam, as I said, who is a fallen man of the earth. His hair, as I've noted in two previous sermons, in particular, hair on a person gives us an awareness of sin. And I explained that, you see it in the hairy goat offering, which is the sin offering. You see it in the Nazarite vow. They're never to cut their hair when they have taken this vow. And it's a reminder of their consecration to God. All right, it is a picture of our fallen state. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus had to be made like his brethren and that he himself has suffered being tempted. The symbolism of Isaac feeling Jacob is realized in the humanity of Jesus Christ. He had hair like Adam. He had flesh like Adam. And yet to him belongs the birthright and the blessing, just like Jacob. Isaac wanted to know if this is really his son or not. And we need to know that Jesus Christ really is the son of man. Verse 22, so Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And I wonder how many of you know where this is going already, the hands. Of course, God the father knows God the son, but the picture here is as clear as it could be. The sweet heavenly voice of the Lord Jesus the voice that spoke the universe into existence is concealed in the body of a man with the hands of Adam. The divine word of God, of course, is the Lord, but the hands are Adam's hands. The picture one sees in this verse is as clear as crystal when you know who Jesus Christ is. Jacob went near his father boldly to show him that he in fact met the requirements of the blessing and Jesus is no different. He came forward in the flesh to receive the blessing of promise, which he himself had spoken to Abraham, to Isaac, and which he will speak to Jacob in the future. It all begins with Jesus and it all belongs to him. In this verse, it says that Isaac felt Jacob, but it focuses on his hands. They're noted as the confirmation of the person. In the same way, Jesus' hands are universally thought of as the confirmation of his manhood and of his act upon the cross. John 20 shows us this very clearly. Here's what it says in John chapter 20. So he said to them, and this is Thomas who says this. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. It is Thomas, the twin, who confirms Jesus' crucifixion, his resurrection and his humanity. All of this is pictured in the twins, Jacob and Esau. If you remember from that previous sermon where we spoke about the name of Thomas, his name comes from the Hebrew word ta'om, which means twin, and that's translated as Thomas. Jesus picked each one of his disciples by name, and he picked them because each of their names has relevance to his work, and we see it prefigured right here in the book of Genesis. How can we not believe that this is the word of God when it is so intricately and beautifully woven together for us? The perfection of the Bible to me is absolutely astonishing. Hebrews chapter nine continues with the fulfillment of the symbolism we see in Jacob coming to his father. It says here, but Christ came as a high priest. As I said, Jacob is coming with the priestly garments of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You gotta remember, Jacob is in a tent, and it says that Jesus went to the more perfect tabernacle or tent. 
The author of Hebrews says that this perfect tabernacle is not made with hands, and yet Jesus went behind the veil with his own blood presenting his hands. The voice of Jesus speaks out to each one of us. I really am a man. I shed my blood, see my hands. Isaac is determining if it is Esau who is in fact Jacob, just as God the Father confirms that Jesus has replaced Adam, the voice in the hands, the power of the word, and the beauty of the Lord. Verse 23, and he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. The two are indistinguishable, Esau and Jacob, Adam and Jesus. Jacob came in Esau's likeness and Jesus came in Adam's likeness. Again, we see the confirmation of this given in the New Testament. This is from the book of 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Isaac could have given this blessing to Esau at any time in his life. And as we know, I said earlier and I said last week, Esau is now 77 years old and Isaac is 136 years old. The blessing came at a time when Isaac was so old that he simply couldn't tell the difference. Had he given this blessing at an earlier time or an earlier stage of his life, this account never would have happened but so that we can see the symbolism that Jesus is a physical replica of Adam. It came at a time when no difference could be discerned. The wisdom of God is written all over the account of an old man who is blind, who is bedridden, and so the blessing is granted. Verse 24, then he said, are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. Isaac is still wondering if he's doing the right thing, and so he asks one more time if it's his son Esau. The stress on whether it is Esau or not has come to focus at least five times in this account, and he has mentioned Esau by name three times. This is connecting us right back to Genesis 1, verse 26, which states this. Then God said, let us make, the word make, man in our image according to our likeness. Esau, his name means made, and man was made, or asaw. It's the same word, just with a, a different vowel point. He was made according to the likeness of a man, a full man. The story is continually bringing to mind the connection between Jacob and Esau and Jesus resembling the man who is made from the dust, Esau. Nothing could be clearer and it provides the surety that we need, even from the Old Testament, that Jesus really is the divine Son of God who came in human flesh, beautifully intricate and glorious in its purpose is God's word to us. Verse 25, he said, bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. It can't be missed that the meal is as important to Isaac as is giving this blessing. The two are tied together in his mind and he states it as such. Bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. The blessings of the Bible are noted around the giving of offerings. If you remember in Genesis chapter 8, Noah's offering preceded the Lord's blessing. Melchizedek brought out bread and wine and then blessed Abraham. Abraham's offering of Isaac on Mount Moriah led to the oath and the blessing of the Lord. Even the high priestly blessing, which I give every week before we leave here, which is found in Numbers chapter 6, directly follows the offerings of the Nazarite vow. Now the two are separate concepts, I know that, but they are noted one right after the other. Isaac will only bless after the offering is received. Verse 25 continues, so he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. The same terminology is given in response to Isaac's request. In Hebrew it says, Hagishali, and it leads to veyagesh lo, bring it near to me. And so he brought it near to him. The meal precedes the blessing and obedience precedes the bestowal of that blessing. Jacob brings the meal and he brings the wine. The word here, yain, and I'm probably gonna offend somebody by saying what I'm gonna say, it indicates fermented drink in the Bible, not grape juice. It's where we get our word wine from, yain and wine. Noah was made drunk with this yain or this wine. Melchizedek, on the other hand, brought out the same wine and he gave it to Abraham for a blessing. And both of uh, Lot's daughters 
used this yine or wine to get their father drunk, which was something bad, but if you remember the sermon, it turned into something exceptionally good because both of those children became ancestors of Jesus Christ, right in his genealogy. And so the Bible only forbids alcohol being drank two times in all of its pages. Both of them are under the law and both of them are for very specific reasons which can only be found under the law. I don't know if anybody here knows what those two specific occasions are, but one is when the high priest or his sons were performing the duties of the priest in the tabernacle, and the second time was during the time of consecration of the Nazarite vow. After both of those, when they left the, uh, the tabernacle doing their ministering or the vow was over, they could again drink wine. Okay, the blessing of wine is noted as often as the trouble that it brings. And the lesson that the Bible wants us to learn about the drinking of alcohol is that we are to control it, not let it control us. If we cannot control it, then we should not drink. If we can, we may. Now, this is an important precept because I do mission work every single Saturday morning of my life with a man who is a reformed alcoholic. And it would be the epitome of arrogance and stupidity for me to invite him to my house and have a glass of wine sitting there. Oh, I'm going to have a glass of wine while you sit there and watch me. All right. We need to have empathy towards other people's state, whatever it is. I know other people that are giving up drinking. They've been pursuing this diligently. And it would be the epitome of stupidity for me to say, come on, let's go out to the bar and I'll have a drink and you don't. Okay. At the same time, it would be the epitome of legalism and mishandling the Bible for me to condemn somebody for having a drink at dinner. Okay. We need to take the Bible as it is written and we need to be very careful how we handle it. I'm not promoting the drinking of alcohol, but I am also telling you that you cannot condemn a fellow Christian who does drink alcohol. Only two occasions in the Bible, both do not apply today. Just be careful how you handle this and do not be drunk with wine, okay? The Bible doesn't want us ever to get drunk if you drink. Verse 26, then his father Isaac said to him, come now near me and kiss me, my son. This is the very first time in the Bible that the act of kissing is mentioned. It has been about 2,245 years since the creation of the world. And there were possibly, as we saw back in the early Genesis sermons, billions of people on the earth before the year 1656 when God destroyed the world by flood. There were possibly billions of people. And since that time, there are certainly millions, if not hundreds of millions of people on earth. There were certainly a jillion kisses in those 2,245 years, and yet not one kiss is mentioned in the life of any person until this one right here. And so the significance should not be lost on us. The kiss is tied to the son's blessing. The word for kiss is used only 35 times. This word for kiss is used only 35 times in 35 separate verses of the Old Testament. And one other word is going to be used twice. That means that there are only 37 mentions of the, of the act of kissing in the entire Old Testament. The father asks the son for a kiss and he receives the blessing. Now we are asked to do the same. The second psalm shows you the picture that God intends for us to see. Here's what it says. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Just as Jacob received the blessing with a kiss, we too participate in the blessing when we kiss the son. And that brings us to our second thought today, the Father's blessing. Verse 27, and he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, okay, I'll stop right there in the middle of the verse. In last week's sermon, I said that there is a speculation about the clothes that Jacob is wearing, which belonged to Esau. The term used for those garments at that time was ha hamudot, which means the precious. These were probably special garments uh, used for ministry and we're, we can be certain of this because Rebecca had those garments okay instead of Esau's wives now Esau has been married for 37 years and he has two wives why aren't these garments kept with Esau's wives it's because they are garments for ministry he is the one that is going to perform the priestly blessings for the the house especially because Isaac being blind 
could no longer perform those blessings or those priestly functions. And this verse seems to confirm exactly this. It says, Isaac smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him. Now, before I prepared this sermon, I always assumed that these words meant that Isaac uh, liked the natural smell of his son Esau. But now I see that that's not the case at all. After thinking these words through and looking at particular the words of the blessing that's coming, I do see this differently. In the next verse, the blessings begin and they are stated in the form of a very keen mind, an alert mind, not one that's drunk by wine, but one with elevated senses. What Isaac says is in poetic style of parallel clauses, this, 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 this. It's parallelism, okay? And then it contains unusual forms that are noted as poetic as well. Instead of, for example, using the word behold, which is most often in the, the Bible used, hine, he uses a different word for behold, which is re'e. And the reason is because the next word, smell, is re'ach. It becomes poetic because of the alliteration. Here it is in Hebrew. It says re'e re'ach, beni kereach, sader asher, sade asher berachol Adonai. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. It really is beautiful to hear when it's properly pronounced and unfortunately you'll have to listen to somebody else to really get a good sense of it but like I said the smell of my son was speaking about not about Esau's manliness but rather it is speaking about the clothing which has been kept by Rebecca the smell is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed okay what is it that we use to smell the smell of a field we use incense the smell of the priestly incense would cling to these special garments, just like the smell of patchouli clings all over me. Even at, it hides my manly smell, and it also stays on these clothes. Even if I put them through the washing machine, you will still smell this patchouli on me. And that is what he is smelling, like a field that the Lord is blessed. Incense heightens our mental state, and it reminds us of the goodness that the Lord provides, whether it's grass, or whether it's flowers or whether it's fruit. A field which the Lord has blessed is vibrant and it's alive. And this is the intent behind the incense. When blessed by the Lord, it is the very garden of Eden. It is a field of delight and it is an inheritance which is fit for a king. The blessings of a priest are being passed down from father to son. Again, the fulfillment is found right in Jesus Christ. Here's Hebrews chapter five. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become a high priest. Jacob is now assuming the priestly roles of the family with this blessing. But it was he who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And Jacob is now becoming the begotten of the father through this blessing. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The blessing of Melchizedek went upon Abraham. And from Abraham, he blessed his son Isaac. And now Isaac is blessing his son Jacob. All of this is being shown us in this beautiful picture of what Jacob is doing in the presence of his father Isaac. The bestowal of the priestly rite came upon Jesus Christ, just as it now comes upon Jacob from Isaac. Verse 28, therefore may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth. Isaac uses a term here, Ha Elohim, or the God in his blessing. That's what it actually says. It doesn't just say God, and translators leave out the word the. It's not a very often occurrence in the Bible either, so to me it's rather sad that these translators leave the the out because it tells us something. There is the true God, and there are false gods. Isaac's blessing concerned the true God. May he give you the dew of heaven is speaking about the rains which God gives to provide the crops increase. Without them, the land, it dries and it dies. But with the rains come abundance and prosperity. The fatness of the earth speaks of the richest soil which will produce the most bountiful crops. It is the nutrients which give life to the seed and bring them up, bring them up in a harvest beyond normal and even to overflowing. Verse 28 continues, and plenty of grain and wine May the rains of heaven and the rich soil bring increase so that they bring about plenty of grain and wine as this blessing is giving them. In Deuteronomy chapter eight, the blessings of the land of Israel are noted by Moses 
before the people move into the land. Let me read this to you. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of fine vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Of course, in this blessing, there's a spiritual element as well. It's not just a physical blessing. Jacob would receive what Isaac pronounced, and it would continue on through all 12 of his sons who became the nation of Israel. But there is this spiritual aspect that we need to note. The dew of heaven is the increase given by God, which is found in the gospel message. The fatness of the ground is the rich soil of those who will simply hear and receive the word. Jesus explains this in quite a few parables. There is a literal fulfillment, and there is also a spiritual or a symbolic one as well. And what I want to do is I want to read you one of these parables. It's a little long, but I want you to think about this blessing that he is pronouncing upon Jacob and how it's fulfilled in Jesus. Here we go. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And some fell among, I'm sorry, I read that. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop, a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, Who, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables that seeing they may not see. Isaac can no longer see, and hearing that they may not understand. Isaac heard the voice, but he didn't understand. Now this is the, the parable is this. This is Jesus continuing. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, and the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones who are on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while and in a time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Now I want to stop right there and I want to ask each one of you to consider yourself. There's seed that's on the wayside and the birds peck it up or people trample on it and it never grows. And maybe you're here today and maybe you've never actually allowed the Word of God to enter into your life and to grow in you so that you understand who God is and who, what he has done through his son, Jesus Christ. And then of course, you have the next group of people who fall along the rocks and there's a little bit of soil and they go down there and they sprout right up because rocks have moisture in the morning time. They, they, you know, they get cold and hot and so the moisture gathers on them and the thing springs right up. Of course, there's not enough soil for it to, uh, to grow roots. So this thing pops up and the heat of the sun burns it away. And maybe you've heard the word of God in your life and maybe you've, oh, I, this is great, you know? And then all of a sudden you just, you fade away because it never sank in to you and you've never accepted what God truly has for you in his life. And then of course you have the third category, which is, it, it's a very hard category to be in because you hear the word, you grow, but along with you are growing all of the weeds of the world. You know, you've got sexual immorality, you've got uh, drunkenness, you've got uh, drugs, you've got all kinds of profane thing on TV and it just draws your attention away from the Lord. And so you become choked out from the kingdom because of all these other things when in fact you started out wanting to pursue Jesus Christ. So each one of us needs to apply this lesson to ourselves. And there is one other type that Jesus says and this finishes the parable. But the ones that fell on good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart keep it and bear fruit with patience. And I would ask each person here to have a noble and good heart and to allow the word of God to sink into you and to grow in you and then grow to maturity where you actually start bearing fruit for Jesus Christ. You're dropping seed all over the place and telling people about Jesus and you can't shut up about him because you love him so desperately. That is what Jesus Christ wants and he allows us to make these choices. It's not forced on us. It is something that is inside of us or it's not. So please think on that parable today, what God would have you
to know and also apply it or think about it in comparison to what Isaac is doing with Jacob right here, how they're tied together so beautifully. Isaac's blessing upon is upon his son of promise and God's blessing is upon his son who was promised. The first part of the blessing was one of material prosperity. The part found in the next verse is one of power and authority. This is verse 29. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Isaac, who is the son of promise through Abraham, passes on the blessing of authority over the people groups that they would encounter. And if you know the stories of the Bible, eventually they subdued all the nations around them when they were in obedience to the Lord. Later they were subdued by them. The blessing is stated in anticipation of the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given to Rebecca before the children were even born, where it said that the older would serve the younger. They would separate, the older and the younger would be Israelites and the Edomites. They'd separate into these two different nations and the older would eventually serve the younger, just as recorded in the book of Chronicles and Kings. Isaac's words now confirm that Jacob will fulfill this role just as prophesied, but more than just his brother, all people who they would encounter would become subject to them. Of course, the spiritual fulfillment of this is also found in Jesus Christ, who will rule the nations exactly as prophesied in the second Psalm. Here's what it says. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. If you know the book of Revelation right up, I think it's in chapter one, the ultimate fulfillment of this is found right there when Jesus Christ will rule, rule all of the nations during the millennial reign, which is coming, I believe, rather soon. Israel's back in the land. The end times, I believe, are coming. I think the world is lining up that way right now. There'll be seven years of tribulation and then there's gonna be a thousand year glorious rule of crane on Christ on earth when he rules all of the nations from Jerusalem. Verse 29 continues, be master over your brethren and let your mother, mother's sons bow down to you. This continues the preeminency of Jacob over Esau. Now he's the only recorded brother of uh, Jacob in the Bible, but there could have been others and this seems to indicate that there are because your mother's sons is plural. Eventually, the line of Esau, though, was in fact subordinate to Israel, and they were finally assimilated into the people about the time of Jesus before the dispersion. Israel has been given both the blessings of power and authority over his brothers, but the spiritual blessings we see are fulfilled again in Jesus Christ. Esau pictures Adam and thus the people of the world. Jacob pictures Jesus. In Ephesians chapter six, Jesus is called our master. And in Philippians chapter two, right after this canonic hymn, which tells that Jesus emptied himself and uh, went to the cross on our behalf, we read these words. It says, therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 29 continues. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. The final part of Isaac's blessing is repeated from Genesis 12, verse three, when God made the same promise to Abraham many, many years earlier. It passed through his son Isaac, and now it is passed on to Jacob. And once again, we see the fulfillment in Jesus, and Paul tells about it in Galatians chapter three. Here's what he says. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham before saying, in you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. We need to remember here that it was Isaac's intention to bless Esau, just as it was God's design for man to rule the earth. But Esau was out in the field looking for food when the blessing came and Adam still had the taste of the forbidden fruit in his mouth when his curse came. But God's plan in the end will right every wrong. As you can see here, the Bible is not just a bunch of disconnected stories without regard to an overall point and purpose. Instead, it is a demonstration of the wisdom of God as he works out this immensely beautiful plan of reconciling all the world to himself. He has used real people to picture a story 
of man. Esau is Adam, Jacob is Jesus. We are all sons of Adam by birth. But Jesus put on garments of flesh and he came in the likeness of Adam to restore that which was fouled up. Paul, writing to Timothy, says that Jesus was manifest in the flesh and vindicated by the Spirit. Now he offers us that same opportunity. We can move from Adam to Jesus. We can be a part of the blessing and the victory instead of the curse and the condemnation. We can go from being manifest in the flesh as each one of us is here, human beings, and we can be vindicated by the Spirit. And I wanna ask two more minutes of your time to explain how this can happen in your life. As we've seen these pictures, Adam was created. He was a man made from the dust, just as Esau was a man made in the womb. He looked like a fully developed man because of all of his hair. The words are the same. And then his name was changed to Edom, which is basically the same word as Adam once again. He's picturing us. And here we have Jacob, who is coming in a picture of Jesus Christ. He's receiving the blessings from the Father. And Jesus Christ receives the blessings from the Father because he was given a mission. He came to fulfill the law that you and I can never fulfill. God gave us this law. And he says, if you do these things, you will live by them. And Paul explains very clearly in the New Testament, we don't even need it to, to know it, but he explains it that no one can fulfill the law. It's impossible. The just will live by faith in the laws of deeds and the deeds condemn us. But Jesus was capable of fulfilling the law. He said, I have not come to abolish the law. The law stands for every person on earth today. He says, I came to fulfill it. So you have a choice. God demands absolute perfection for those that enter into his paradise, but we're fallen. And so what we need to do is we need to have a perfection that is not our own. Jesus Christ lived that law, he fulfilled it, and now we can enter into Jesus Christ and be vindicated by the Spirit by accepting Jesus' work on our behalf. And then more, he gave up his life on the cross as a sacrifice of atonement. He became literally that mercy seat. He is called the propitiation in the New Testament, the same word to describe Jesus as the mercy seat of the Old Testament. His blood is now what covers us so that when God the Father looks down on fallen us, all he sees is his righteous son. And that is how we are restored to God the Father. We can't go back before Adam's sin and we inherited Adam's sin, but Jesus Christ is outside of time and space and matter and he can do that for us. And so I would ask that if you have never in your heart asked Jesus Christ to simply forgive you of your sins, and to call on him as Lord saying, I can't do it. I want Jesus to do it on my behalf. If you do that and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, well, why is that important? Because nobody would call on a dead Lord. He really came out of the grave and I'm accepting that. And that means that I too will share in his eternality. I will be alive forever in the presence of the Lamb of God because of what he did on my behalf. It's great stuff and I would ask that you do that today. It's that simple too. There's nothing more you need to do to be saved. And then after that, go out and do good works for Jesus Christ. Next week uh, is our uh, sermon on Genesis 27 verses 30 through 40. It's called, It's Not Deja Vu. All right. I have a closing verse for you. It's uh, from Psalm 72. It's verse 11. It says, yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. The day is coming when all nations of the earth will serve Jesus Christ. We're railing against him now, but it's not always going to be that way. And if you've called on Jesus and been vindicated by the Spirit, victory is coming. It is coming for all of us that have put our hope in him. All right, of course, I have every week, as I do, a poem based on the, uh, uh, the verses that we've evaluated. And I'm going to do something different in this poem that I've never done before. The blessing that was given by Isaac to Jacob, I'm not going to put in poetic form. I'm going to read it just as it was read. And the reason why is because it is in poetic form in the Hebrew. It's in parallel couplets, and it's also in this beautiful alliteration. If you want to hear it, you can go online and send me an email. I'll send you the link, and there's a guy that just reads the Bible. He's a rabbi that died years ago, but he's recorded the entire Old Testament. And you can listen to it, and it's beautiful. Anyway, here we go with this week's poem. It's called Kiss the Sun. Isaac said to Jacob, please come near this spot that I may feel you, my son. Whether you are really my son Esau or not, I want to make sure I'm blessing the right one. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him. And then he said, the voice is Jacob's, certainly not another, but the hands are those of Esau instead. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy. 
like Esau's hand, so he blessed him, though he was wary. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? He said, I am, it's true. He said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat it all, my son's gain, so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate. Then he brought him wine, and he drank too. Then his father Isaac said to him, It's great. Come near now and kiss me, my son. I will bless you. And he came near and kissed his father's head, and he smelled the smell of his clothing too. And he blessed him, and in the blessing he said, Listen, my son, that which I pronounce upon you. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. This is the blessing of Isaac to Jacob his son, and it is proven true in world's history. But it also points to Jesus, the rightful one, upon whom the blessing falls ultimately. It is he who has inherited all things from the Father, and he is the one to take the place of Adam, you see. To him belongs all glory. It is not for another. It is he who prevailed over death for you and for me. And so to our Lord we bow our knees, and to Jesus we give our lives willingly. Into our heart he looks and he sees the soul who has entrusted him for all eternity. Forever we shall sing your praise. Yes, glory to the King for eternal days. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your beautiful word, which just continuously shows us of Jesus. It just reveals him in the most beautiful ways and in pictures that are so wonderfully woven together. How can we not just stand and praise you for what you have given us in your word? Thank you. Thank you for him. Thank you for what he did. Thank you for the surety and the promise of eternal life because of his deeds and not because of our own. Lord, I ask that you bless each person here as they go out into the world. And I, I just ask that you keep them from harm and from fear and from trial. And uh, just may we meet again next week here in the presence of uh, your glorious presence under these beautiful trees until the day that uh, the building is ready for us to move into. And until that day, let us just keep uh, praising you for your goodness. Lord, we love you. We praise you. All glory, all honor, all majesty, all of it, all of it belongs to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.